Welcome, Father. We've been expecting you. A bag is something else! The king! Hello and welcome to YCFT. It's still December here, so ignore the Christmas decorations. Ignore all Christmas sprouts. <laughs> all the Christmas sprouts. We are talking about, well, it's been about a year since we did the first Howling, so yeah. I had to convince you a little bit, but I decided to do the Howling 2. Yeah. What was the alternative the name for this one? Um, I've got Your Sister is a Werewolf, which is one of them, and there was another one. I think something like Sturber Werewolf like, Bitch or something like, like that. Queen Bitch or something yeah, like that. which it's... America was like, Abs absolutely not. No. Admittedly, I had never seen this film before trying to convince you to watch it. No. I just had this idea that every year until we get through them, we could do... We'll go through the we'll Howlings. Go through, we'll go through the Howlings. I knew going into this that the first one is the best. Yes. So this was 1985? This Five. one came out? So about yeah. A couple of years after the first one. Uh -huh. Starring the late, great Christopher Lee. Yes. In a film that he apologised on the set of Gremlins 2 to Joe Dante, apologised for being in the Howling 2 instead of the Howling. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to go straight out and say it. This is not a great film. No. There is a lot no. about it that I really enjoyed. Same. And a lot that I really didn't. Yes. The make, everything surrounding this film, the make, like the making of it. Yeah, it's is fascinating. so much more interesting. Yeah. So I kind of almost want to blitz through the film. Okay. So that we can get to that. And we can get to the interesting stuff. Yeah. It is the only one of the Howling sequels to actually follow on from the events of the first movie. The movie opens at Karen's funeral. See, last time we saw her, she was turning into a well on National News um, and getting shot. Live TV. They, now, they kind of retcon that a little bit. Yeah, they do. Yeah, so it's like... It wasn't a live broadcast. It wasn't a live broadcast. The tape had been lost. Kind, kind of annoying. Yeah. A little bit annoying. Yeah. And Chris Lee. Plays a character called Mr. Crossco. Yes. I only just found out what his name is. I've just been calling him Christopher Lee. <laughs> Christopher Lee. Yeah, so he's we... someone who's kind of like knows about the supernatural and he's turned yes. up to the funeral because he's expecting her to turn into a wolf again. Yes. Which she does. Yes. And the film basically revolves around our two leads. Ben, who is Karen's brother, and... Jenny. And Jenny. Who is a colleague of Karen's and was... There, I think, in the newsroom when all yeah. the shit went down. So that means that her mate of the first one must have went down for her murder. Uh, presumably, yeah. Yeah. So they go to Europe with Christopher Lee to defeat the queen of the werewolves, Sturba. Sturba. Played by... Sybil Danning. She is really cool in this. I'll give her that. Yes. So I got loads of trivia just about her, which we'll have to get oh, to in a bit. Oh, we got a lot of trivia. But that's basically the plot of this film. That's just them kind of like encountering werewolves and fighting them off and stuff like that. It's yeah, like mystical shit in Europe. When they get... Well, the thing is, is I think they arrive in Europe together, but then as soon as they get there, Christopher Lee, Crossco, is instantly like, right, I'm going to go do my thing. You two can kind of just fuck off and do your own thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which it's, is telling. The movie is a little bit all over the place, and I think one of the key things that's missing from it is a transformation scene. Yeah. You know those really excellent transformation scenes that we had in the first movie? Basically non-existent in this one. Yeah. But I will say to counteract that, I did miss the transition, but this film does not lack werewolf scenes. No, it Or doesn't. werewolf attacks. So, okay, kudos. Well, yeah, we have a lot more werewolves. We have scenes of like people being attacked by multiple werewolves. I'm uh -huh. like, okay, that's stuff I really like. Uh, Interesting, this script, it was... Oh, the screenplay was... Because the original author... Yeah, Gary Brander. He did not like the first film, so Barry Joe Dante wasn't even asked to no. come back for this one. Yeah. So he penned a screenplay, but then had to basically walk away from the project to meet a publishing deadline. And then yeah. someone else came in uh -huh. and completely rewritten it and took yeah. a plot that had been made for a vampire film Yes. and put werewolves in it. When I was watching... Knowing that watching this film, I was like... I. I can you can see you can tell because there's mm. so many things where I think this isn't traditionally werewolf. No, we also have a few like throwaway scenes of see, of seeing vampires in in the movie because mm. when they are in Europe, um, I think there's a scene, isn't there, where she's like she's getting garlic out in her room and she's like, oh, you can't be too careful, and then it cuts to you know like some hotel 
clerk downstairs and his fangs come out. He's instantly a bit repelled. I completely forgot about that. That, that definitely happens in the movie. Yeah. I did not just make that up. That does happen. Yeah, so it's kind of like <laughs> such a mishmash of different things. Yeah, oh, fucking hell. We even get like a little bit of the Lost Boys in here as well. Yeah, there's definitely bit. some... This, well, this predates Lost Boys, yeah. but, you know, similar kind of vibe. Yeah, it's like the Lost Boys, but for werewolves. Yeah. So, yeah, so to defeat werewolves, they basically need to defeat Sturber. Yeah, the queen of the werewolves. Yeah. She does wear this outfit in the film, and it looks like the most uncomfortable and unpractical thing ever. I mean, it is. It is. Interestingly, the famous shot where she wears sun- she's wearing sunglasses, which yeah. is like the poster and everything, was literally because she turned up and she had conjunctivitis one day, but they still had to film the shot. Yeah, film the shot. The director so, was like, oh, but, oh, we need we need to film. Yeah, she's like, but it's indoors. Why would I wear sunglasses? And I think Barry said to her, you're the queen of the werewolves. You, you do, do what you want. You do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> it's like, and, right. I, I feel like I was judging this film quite harshly until we watched an interview with the director. What was the name of the director? Philippe Mora. Because uh, he'd worked with Chris Lee on a previous project. I believe. Yeah, it's like Miss, oh, it's like Captain Invincible or something like that. Yeah. It's like a spoof, I think. It was like a 50 minute long interview that was on the that was on the Blu-ray and it was fascinating. It was. The making of this film and when you realise that most of it is supposed to be... It's satire. Satire. I was like, I wasn't getting it but so much started to make sense yes. i can kind of understand why this is was disliked when it came out but then became a cult classic you got the people that didn't get it and the people that do yeah i totally agree i all right when we were watching the movie i was lambasting it from beginning to end i was like this is one of the worst movies i've ever seen annie McEnroe, who plays jenny is truly truly one of the worst actresses i have ever seen and like satire or not that doesn't excuse the shit acting it was truly terrible she is such an uninteresting character the guy that plays ben what's he called red brown he's just boring as hell he was he also wasn't a good actor that's yeah the difficult thing when you've got two leads who aren't good they're not like they're not likable they're just fucking boring it's like i don't give a shit about these two people but anyway, yeah, I, I I wasn't following it. There's weird editing that I didn't really like. There's a scene near the beginning, which it was really kind of chaotically edited, where Marsha Hunt, who uh, who plays Mar- Mariana, she plays one of Sturber's, a member of Sturber's gang. And I guess like her job is to, is to sort of lure people in. And um, she's at a club and she like lures these bikers into this like warehouse place. And then she goes full werewolf and she starts attacking them. But just the way it was edited, it was very kind of clunkily done. Mm. And (laughs) I don't know. I just didn't really, I didn't really like how how that was done. And that's where we get like the Lost Boys sort of um, nods and whatnot, you know, like very similar kind of vibe. And yeah, like we, we get these weird transitions peppered throughout the film of like, you know, like star transitions or, you know, swipes across the screen. And I, I read online as I was watching it that Phil, Philippe Mora, the director, he was he's French Australian. But before I realised that, I was watching it and I was thinking, I wonder if this is maybe an American, like first time American filmmaker, who is you know still finding his feet, but who also maybe is his perception of Europe is is kind of solidified in this very sort of archaic image you know like typically portraying europe is like this very you know strange little place that has these strange little customs and you know it's always it's going to be haunted as fuck and of course it's riddled with vampires and like you know weird customs and whatnot and then i realized oh no the guy's french australian (laughs) you know he's like part european and then we watched the interview and i realized he's actually a lot more he's more australian than he is french and I did like this might seem a bit of a generalization, but I do think that Australian humor is a lot more aligned to British humor yeah, than I'd agree. than French humor is aligned to British humor. And hearing him speak and hearing him talk and just say, you know, like this was always meant to be more of a comedy than it was to be taken seriously. And he's like, obviously, Christopher Lee took every role he did very seriously and always played it, you know, very stoically, which kind of lends a bit of credence to it. But he was like, yeah, I this film was always meant to be satire. Always. So I'm really, really happy I did see that interview now because if I do ever rewatch this again, I will watch it with that lens. 
Whereas the first time I watched it, I was like, this is just a director that's trying their hardest to make a good movie and it's shit. I'll just uh, follow on from a few of those points. Yeah. Apparently, you know, Chris Villy was obviously he's very serious. Apparently, he was still, he apparently did have a really good sense of humor and was willing to oh, do yeah. anything. Like the scene in the club where the band are playing like the, the howling theme song for this movie. And Chris Villy puts on these like ridiculous glasses, which is maybe in disguise, trying to blend in. Apparently, because he was always up for a laugh, although apparently the lead's acting did frustrate him a lot. Mm. And quite often he would not linger after after takes. He would just want yeah. to kind of be away. But Chris really did kind of save this movie mm-hmm. because of a big problem. So they'd been, they were shooting in Czechoslovakia. A really interesting thing is like when they turned up, there was like a military procession there. The director said, oh, who's this for? And he went, oh, that's for me. Oh, it's for me, dear boy. And has to do with uh, his time, you know, basically in the se- in the secret service as a Nazi hunter. He's fucking killing Nazis. And he's really beloved. Yeah, he's in... a hero in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the Czech Republic today. Yes. And apparently, like, he told them all about it. Apparently, Christopher Lee does constantly, did, even in his later years, keep getting told off by the British government for saying things he wasn't supposed to say. The little <laughs> stuff he's done is so secret. Yeah. But yeah, uh, he was beloved in that in that country yeah yeah had a hero's um, welcome yeah i would love a movie about chris philly's life if the stuff could ever be released I totally think be so interesting but so they were two weeks in the shooting and the werewolf costumes hadn't arrived yet mm. and when they did arrive a big crate marked planet of the apes arrived and it was a box full of ape suits from and those apparently, movies apparently rang the like i think all the initial five movies were, i'm not sure which one they yeah. were from most likely the most recent one so probably battle the planet of the apes Rang, the, rang them and was like, these are apes. They're not wolves. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're creative. You're working out. He's like, creativity's got nothing to do with it. It's like I'm making a werewolf movie and you've sent me ape yeah. <laughs> costumes. And so Chris really came up with this thing. He's like, how about we film a close-up? Barry loved his, he loved his close-ups. Yeah. Like, yeah, I love how fondly he talks to them. I know. And he said, well, go from man to ape to wolf. So yeah. they filmed this the scene to basically explain it. So then they modified all these suits that kind of look like a midway between man and wolf, mm. the more primal ape-like. Yeah. When you when you notice it and look at them, like, oh my fucking God, yes, that is a Planet of the Apes costume. But yeah. it, it, it worked. Yeah. You know, Christopher Lee, just instant, like the professional that he is, just, you know, troubleshooting what is otherwise a massive fuck up for any director, for any production. Just, you know, quick thinking on his feet like that. Genius. Jumping on what he other things you said earlier about how things are choppily edited. Throughout the movie, between action scenes, it will cut to close-ups of werewolves that were definitely shot somewhere completely different, like mm. in a studio, which I think all these inserts were done after the film had wrapped so they could get a suit that looks more werewolf-like. Mm. And the ones on set are the more ape-like ones. Yeah. I think that lent itself to the choppy editing because they just didn't have the props that they needed. Pro- pro- probably. I remember Maura also says in this interview that because they were filming abroad... Um, another problem he had or he encountered was they, they had to film uh, with a lot of Czech crew who's, you know, had broken English at, at best. So he wasn't always, you know, able to kind of effectively communicate precisely what he wanted. Um, and also it was Soviet ruled at the time as well, yeah. wasn't it? Which I think was like a lot of ex- like on location shooting as well, well in certain scenes. Yeah. Uh, before I go into a point about that, it Chris really apparently agreed to do this because he'd never done a werewolf film. Yeah. He did most of the monsters, but hadn't done a werewolf film. Yet. He's technically so, done an ape film. <laughs> yeah, the Soviet side of things, when they were filming all the uh the club scenes with the band, yeah. apparently they were in the middle of shooting. Uh, they basically as part of course said, Is there any do, are there any punks? Yeah, we need punks. But we need punks. Yeah, and the military showed up. <laughs> and then again, broken English, broke it, you know, broken English. With trans- I think they came with translators, didn't yeah, they? They yeah. had to talk to them. They basically had to explain them what they were doing there. He's like, well, what's a werewolf? So they had to explain what a werewolf is. Apparently the guy just started laughing. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, right, you have to be done in like 15 minutes because it's actually illegal for this many young people to be gathered in one place. Yeah. He's like, but they had to leave in like groups of two. Mm. So he's like, they'd act, they'd not realizing they'd, they were actually breaking the law. But apparently all the punks... Look, they saw being in this movie as some sort of like rebellion. Oh, so yeah. A proper rebellious. 
totally. act. And it's like, that's insane. It is insane. I, it's a great story, but, you know, part of me, you know, I've got to give my respect to Maura. I know I just, I pulled his film to pieces just, you know, five minutes ago, but it's like, that is a tricky situation to be in. Yeah, Plus not the, every day the, a foreign military shows up at your film set. Exactly, and you've not got your proper costumes. It's like that, That and you've got absolutely two of the worst actors that have ever walked the planet as your leads. It's like, that's a shit situation to be in. Yeah, because he did return to do the next one, didn't he? Yeah, the marsupial yeah, one. which is an Australian... Uh, Kangaroos. Obviously set in Australia, which makes sense, French Australia. Yeah. That'll be next January. I have already found oh. that. On, I found that on Blu-ray already. Look forward to that, guys. Yeah. I've only I've only seen one of the ones that comes after that, and it was, I think it was Halloween yeah. Reborn. It was oh, it was god awful. But yeah, uh, apparently he uh, would have to get his wife to ship over American trash to fill up certain yes, scenes. Yes, because it just did, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing in uh, Czechoslovakia, I guess. But the scenes that were meant to be LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's again. It's, I I almost love these type of movies that are particularly good. But the making of them is so interesting. Yeah. Like, I wasn't expecting to be at. I remember seeing this like, oh, 50 minute interview. We probably won't watch all this. We did. Oh, we did. We, we, we watched the beginning to end. There's also something just, you know, I think we both found quite likable about Mora. You know, he was very self deprecating um, and, you know, very kind of self aware. It's like, yeah, you know, I know it's not the best movie ever, but, it, you know, it, it was never meant to be taken seriously. So I think it kind of. It's like, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting like that level of self-deprecation. So I did really appreciate yeah. it. So, the the sex scene. So we have werewolf sex or transforming into werewolves in the first one. Did the best they can with costumes and had to go to a little bit of animation at the end. Very iconic scene. How do you how do you move on? How do you big like go big on that? You make it a threesome. So I think I think some of the dialogue here was what confu- is going to confuse me later on in the movie. But like they often refer to like people who enter the pack as like brothers or sisters. Yeah. So it's like Sturber it's introduces crazy. like a new member of the family to uh, a potential suitor, and they start having sex whilst transforming. So they're getting all hairy. She starts to transform as well. But apparently, the problem when they were filming is as soon as they start touching each other, the hair would come off. Yeah. yeah. So they had to use basically like, you have to kind of mime it. So they're kind of just doing like this and, and yeah. stuff like that. It, I think it actually makes the scene so much fucking better. It does, it, actually. It's actually, like, it's weird, it was weird, like, hypnotic to watch. It, but it's a scene, he said that there's very few scenes that have, like, all right, so we've got a threesome, we've got straight sex in there, we've got uh, bisexual sex we've in there. We've got it all going on. got bestiality. If, because they're all part of a pack, it's technically a little bit of incest. It's yeah. All these things in one scene. Yeah. And not going to lie, it's a really well done scene. And it's just so bizarre to watch. The miming of it, it does add like a an extra layer of eroticism, yeah. I, I guess. Um, and it would have been a very different scene, you know, like if they were just being, you know, like very carnal with, the, with each other. What I really fucking love about this scene is again, like going back to the weird editing of the movie is like we, we start, you know, like the seduction of, of the sex scene. We see the two of them initially getting it on, then we see Sturber getting involved. We keep cutting back to Jenny and Ben being their boring selves, just exploring... Where do they... I can't... Is it Transylvania? I think it might be Transylvania. Yeah, like, they're wandering around there, and they're just, like, going, exploring, like, the little market town. And then we cut back to the threesome, and, like, they're still still fucking... Then we cut back to Ben and Jenny just doing a really boring thing. We cut back to the threesome. They're still going on. It's the longest threesome I've ever seen in my life. Without any actual fucking... (laughs) It's... It's a really interesting scene, but the... Sorry, what's the name of the actress who plays Sturber again? Sybil Downing. Now, see... She said she didn't want to do any nudity in this. No, because I think she she did a lot of nudity in a lot of her previous yeah. films. So she was kind of like, no, I'm I don't done. want to do. This. They come in to do one topless scene. Yeah, and to be honest, I think it's probably one of the best filmed topless scenes I've ever seen in my life. It's satisfying because like, it rips off the course. Yeah. It's like a, and it's like side like side boob angle, and it's it's a good scene. It's like, all right, cool. That's the one boob shot we're getting. And apparently she was fine to do that. What she wasn't fine with was that same shot appearing 17 times in the credits of this movie. Yeah. Which, fair enough. Which, fair enough. Again, in that interview, we found out some context behind it. Because apparently he gets asked about it all the time. Mm-hmm. 
and he said that he started doing it, but then he had to move off on to do other things. And he initially put it in like a couple of times. I think he put it in like three times or something like that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and the joke was that the rip the seed off, then he would pair it with scenes of Wells doing shocked faces. And it's like, he thought it would be funny. Yeah. I don't think he thought they'd actually keep it in. And the editor said, oh, this is really good. Can I do it a few more times? He's like, yeah, go on then. He thought he meant once or twice. Not up to, like, not another, like, 13, 14, 15 times. There are 17 different shots of Sybil. Well, it's the same shot, isn't it? It's ripping off her, yeah, it's just with, repeated. With reactions. For, again, like, with the context, I found that really funny. <laughs> There's a moment, yeah, as well, like, you know, she, like, I don't know, like, the 10th time she does it, and then it cuts to, like, Christopher Lee in a separate scene, like... <laughs> I mean, I, you know, if I was Sybil... I, th- I think she has every right to be a little bit pissed off about that because yeah. it is ridiculous. 17 times, it, like bordering on exploitation yeah. at, that, at that point. However, it is really funny. It is funny. And I kind of knew, I knew because we were what, reading trivia as we were watching it, weren't we? So we knew it was we knew it was going to come yeah. up, but we were, we were counting it every single time. I think we knew that it was in. I don't think we knew the number, so we were counting like, oh my God. Yeah. That's- I've never seen anything like that before. It was it was insane. It was one of the most bizarre things I've ever. It's seen like had the editor it. never seen boobs before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Is that how amazed he was? By I know, this? I know, right? So <laughs> it's just the end of the movie. We have like Jenny has been captured. Ben's just being oh, Ben. Yeah, he Jenny kind of comes in captured. with Christopher Lee, and they've got a couple of friends. They're fighting off Wells. They're a really cool scene. That's where they get attacked yeah. in the night. The darkness kind of helps hide the costumes a little bit, but they're, and that's when you got a lot of cut and weird, cut cuts to like the inserts of like close-ups on werewolves but i find that a really really cool scene and like yeah. this really uh, blows one up with some like ridiculous grenade yeah and i'm like i was like all right this movie has me fully invested right now this yeah. is really fucking cool so then we get the showdown between like uh christopher lee and sturber and it's just a bit of a letdown really it's revealed mm. that they are brother and sister it's like it's kind of yeah but are they it's it's kind of weird because then like she like wants to like say like, oh we we be wedded in the flames or something like that. i'm like this is a really weird scene yeah it's weird different reasons firstly when we're first introduced to sturber earlier on in the movie we initially see her as a very old decrepit woman and she has to feed off a young like presumably a young virgin you know like to get the life force and whatnot and then she transforms into sybil danning so how old sturber is actually meant to be is unclear but she's meant to be old and if she's the queen of the werewolves then she's been around for presumably a long time but yeah the ending with crossco which revealed oh they're brother and sister so how old that makes her i don't know but christopher lee in this movie is like probably like i don't know in his like 50s early 60s so can't be like that much of an age difference between them really but then it's like well Is when, it like with their pack when they refer, like, referring to people who are brother and sister who aren't brother and sister? Is yeah. it the same thing? Because they've clearly clashed in the past. Yeah. We meet again. For the last time. And there were, you are right, like, there, were, there was a weird sort of sexual dynamic to that final scene. Because yeah. she, she says, like, you've never been able to resist me. Yeah, that's a terrible it's like, quote. I would really have loved an expedition. Exp- I can never say it. exhibition. Expedition. You know what word I'm thinking of? Exposition. <laughs> exposition. Exposition dump. I needed something to kind of explain what was going on between these two characters. Yeah, but we just didn't, and I found that like after the movie was proper, bringing me back in with like all the action that we were getting, and then it just kind of like let me. It was like a bit of a letdown. Yeah, it was... It was just for a character who's like been built up as much as Sturber was. And I, yeah. I think like she has an element of cool just throughout this entire movie. Yeah, totally. And it's like, oh, is that it? But then they also don't really have any... They don't have any previous scenes together. No, that's the first, first scene they have together. And it's like, it's over, like like that. A flashback, she, something. Yeah, <laughs> now we'll be wedded for eternity. Yeah. So it's like, she also accepts her death very quickly as well. She yeah. doesn't really care that much. I don't know, It, it it's strange. We will be wedded for eternity. For eternity. Again, if I if you replaced werewolves with vampires, I feel like this plot would work so much better. You know how it was supposed, how it was written. Yeah, 
Because everything like about like the lair and everything, the rituals that they do. Oh very yeah, very vampiric. I I love Marsha Hunt in this movie. She's the one who plays Mariana. Um, the what the what one of the werewolves that's involved in the threesome. She's really good. And like you, you know, you were saying as we were watching it, like they give it their all. Yeah, the, the werewolf. Everyone actors. who plays a, were- a werewolf gives it their all, which makes Ben and Jenny seem even worse. <laughs> that that's the thing. It's it's like like, they're like, walking down the street and you got these these uh, werewolves who are all going like. It's so over it's, the top, but give me that it. over Ben and Jenny any day. Like I, I can't even describe how annoyed they made me. Like they are truly the most vanilla characters I have ever seen. Especially following up from the characters that we had in the first film. Yeah, I don't want to see. Why would I want to watch Ben and Jenny when you know there are hairy werewolf nips go? You know, like in in another scene, it's like I don't want to watch these two people. Show me the werewolf three. I could have said like at any point does I, I again I can't really remember like. Do any of the scenes of the werewolf threesome coincide with the, when they get together? Because I remember when they get together, like their sex scene is really boring. Well, and just, I, I don't know if it's meant to be like contrasting, like yeah, they have sex the, up against how the limiting it is to be human. I don't know. I don't know. I may. I don't even think the sex scenes are juxtaposed. I I don't think so. I think they have to. Well, first of all, like, he doesn't even really want to share a room with her. She insists that they share a room together, and then they just have sex up against the wall, and then they go and explore a little market. I think, and then they separate. Yeah, exactly. Dumb. And then Jenny's like off camera for a long time because she's captured. And I genuinely forgot. There was about 10 minutes in the movie where I forgot her character existed. <laughs> they're just, they're not, they're not fun to follow. And I, I can't imagine Christopher Lee was rude to the actors, but I can absolutely believe that he did probably, you know, quietly distance himself from them because he was maybe a bit ashamed and, you know, knew that he was working with people that weren't so yeah. great <laughs> yeah they were the biggest downfall all things that was you know bad about this movie they were the worst for me yeah even like the monkey suits were better yes as i say like you know this film does not lack werewolf content there's there's some cool death scenes actually like there's some really cool effects yeah there's one on the wind like someone gets like their eyes like oh yeah that's gnarly destroyed like burst it's yeah there's so much there, there are some cool, like, there is a lot of cool stuff in here. Mm. It's just sandwiching a lot of like either boring or strange or just doesn't make any sense. Downright I bizarre. Probably will watch this again because I want to make a bit more sense of it. But like I think I got a bit more enjoyment out of it than you did. I think I just kind of got sucked in to yeah. the weirdness. But I knew what I'm watching isn't good. Yes. And I know we shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to go watch like a nearly hour long interview of a director to Enjoy, to make a movie better but I am saying that I it put a few things in context for me that did help my enjoyment I agree I think I would also watch this again but I feel like the next time we'll probably be in prep for when we do the third the, one the third one yeah. just to kind of familiarize mm. myself with Moore's work maybe and you know get back into that wacky yeah mindset it's a shame because I know they because up to the end of the first one sets up one of the characters who was supposed to be what Marsha Hunt is that the actress Marsha Hunt that role was supposed to go be her from the first one. The actress's name I can't I can't remember, but she was asked. But I think because of like what happened with because she didn't want D Wallace. No, the one who was in the well sex scene in the first one. Oh yeah, I, don't, like, I can't remember her name. She was wasn't happy with the amount of her there. nudity that was on display for that one, mm-hmm. so she refused. They I didn't want to come back for this one, so they basically created Marshawn's character. Who, to be honest, I, I didn't really have a, I didn't have a problem with it at all. I think she was a really cool character. And there's something she's about great. I think she's maybe one that can uh, a wealth that can go on hallowed ground or something like that, or mm. or silver doesn't affect. There's something special about her as a wealth, but it's not really explored. No, no. And then um, I can see why this is a cult classic. Like I get there's something there is something about it that is so fascinating. Yeah. Like how a movie like this exists. It is. It's a weird little eighties horror movie that seems on first watch very chaotic, very poorly made. But again, that interview was, it did provide a lot of context that, you know, I wish I kind of had maybe before I went into the movie. Um, But yeah, it is, you know, it's not the first, it's not the first film. So do not ever go and watch The Howling 2 expecting, you know, like a, a serious, thematically serious movie that, you know, like talks about, 
uh, sexual trauma and, and talks about, you know, all of, all of that kind of stuff that the first one does. Um, it, this is not that. <laughs> this is not that. But if you want to see a, a werewolf threesome... Oh, this is your movie. <laughs> and the greatest side boob shot ever filmed. 17 times. 17 times. Well, it's 17 times in the credits, so it's 18 times in the entire movie. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to see some cool, like, some genuinely cool, like, little action sequences, and Christopher Lee being Christopher Lee, that, there's enough there for me to want to watch this film again. Yeah. But I would always pick the first one. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Which I, I don't think comes as a surprise as anyone who's seen the first no, one. <laughs> I think the fact that Christopher Lee literally apologised to Joe Dante says a lot, <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, considering how little of the author's script or screenplay was used... It kind of seems a shame that they didn't ask him to come back. Yeah. As much as I, I do like the director of this one, I think he's really nice. If they'd got Joe back for it, we would have got an entire completely different movie. Yeah, I don't think Joe Dante would have wanted to go down the route of there being a, a queen. So yeah, maybe. Do you think it would have been played out like this? No, yeah. not a million years. I, yeah, exactly. He would have had a bit more credit, that like street credit at that point. So he might have been able to pull a bigger budget for it. Yeah, maybe. Because I don't know when Gremlins 2 came out, but I'm assuming it was like mid-80s. Well, Gremlins 1 would have came out by that point. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe he was working on Gremlins... Oh, yeah. No, he wouldn't have been. Because Christopher Lee's obviously in the second Gremlins movie yeah. anyway. Yeah. Joe Dante was big. <laughs> yeah. So, you got any more notes? No. <laughs> I liked the puppet show that we see oh, briefly yeah, in the movie. There's a puppet show. That kind of, you know, is... Um, I don't know what the word is, but when the, the the puppet show is like playing out what's actually happening in real life as well, it's like a, you know a wolf attack. Yeah. So um, I did quite like that. Would have yeah, actually seen like. a little bit more of it. Yeah, it could, if, the, if the film's not going to give us any more like flashbacks and wider context, these little puppet shows can tell us what's actually going on. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, the, the setting was was nice. Love seeing Europe. Um, back in the eighties, that's always fun. I don't know if we've really sold people on this, but uh. Yeah, anything else from you? No. So, yeah, check it out if you want. If you're if you're curious, like I said, there is enjo- there is enjoyment to be had from it. Yeah, there is. The there Blu-ray is. is gorgeous. There's a really nice it loads of special features on there on the on the making of it, interviews. Mm. There's an alternate opening and ending, which low res, I personally couldn't notice that much of a we difference of why like some little dialogue. Yeah, there was no difference whatsoever that we we spotted. Yeah, maybe like I said, maybe just like a little bit of dialogue. But the making of like all the making of stuff was really interesting. It's unapologetically an 80s film as well. Yeah. You know, so there's It's unapologetically an 80s sequel. Yeah. The, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we'll see you next year for The Howling Free, The Marsupials. Ooh. <laughs> it's a date. Yes. Get that in your calendars. <laughs> yeah. And we'll also see you next week. Bye.